In the last video, we talked about how, if you know what a population is like, and um, you take a sample of all possible combinations of two people from that population, you calculate their means, you can create the distribution of the kind of sample means that you get from that population. Well, um, now we're going to talk about that same idea, uh, but we're going to put it in uh, a more relevant context for uh, these inferential tests, the statistical tests that we're going to talk about in this class. And I'm also going to introduce this way I'm going to organize the different distributions we're going to use throughout this whole class. So um, I'm going to set it up such that the top distribution is going to be the population distribution where um, we're perhaps getting our sample, our observed sample. Uh, we don't actually observe the population distribution, uh, but it's going to be part of the um, inferential statistical process that we use. There's going to be the sampling distribution. right? And just like in the last video, these are going to be the kinds of sample means that you expect from this population due to random sampling. And down here on the bottom, we're always going to put our observed sample data, our observed sample distribution. And when you're doing research, this is the only thing you actually ever observe. The people that come into your lab, you put them down here. When you're doing SPSS and you create a frequency distribution, you're doing it of your observed sample. But the population distribution and the sampling distribution, these turn out to be really important for how statistical uh, tests work. Um, so uh, even though you don't actually see them when you're doing your research, they're a really important part of how the statistical programs are doing the uh, the, the math for your statistical test that you're doing. Um, and so we're going to be talking about these throughout the whole class for most of the tests that we do. Right? And these are all uh, basically frequency distributions, histograms. Um, and for right now, we're going to work with an example where we know the population mean and standard deviation. Uh, we'll work with uh, American uh, adult IQ. So we know the population mean, mu, is 100, and the population standard deviation is 15. Um, this uh, measure is actually uh, standardized, so that it, that's the case. Right? So at our population level here, the mean, mu, is 100. The standard deviation, uh, sigma, is 15. Okay, we know that. We'll come back to the sampling distribution in a little bit. First, we'll talk about the observed sample. So these are people that come into our lab when we uh, measure them. Right, so I'm gonna try to keep, so this is where 100 is here, and 100 is here, right? So this is 115, 115. This is where 115 is. Uh, and then I guess 130 would be about there. So let's say I do a study and I have Southern Utah University students come in um, and I measure their IQ. And I have uh, nine of them do so. So I have nine students in my study. My sample size is nine. We'll say they're distributed uh, kind of like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, so here's our nine participants. Uh, we measure their IQ. Uh, and this is how they're distributed. And the mean of our sample, our sample mean X bar, We'll say that's 115. Uh, and when we're doing research, we're always going to want to know, throughout all the tests that we do, what's the likelihood of our SUU students coming from the population of regular American adults? If our sample is probably from this distribution, well then we're probably then SUU students are probably just as smart as regular old Americans. But it's possible that our sample is from a different population, for example, one that's pushed over further, so, and it's comprised of more intelligent folks, right? So uh, we're hoping in this case that SU students are smarter than Americans, uh, generally. And so the, our sample was mean was 115, so that's a pretty smart sample, right? So what's the chance that you would get a sample with this IQ from this population? It's the sampling distribution that's going to tell us that. Um, and so I'm going to talk about next the, how, you can, how you determine uh, the characteristics of the sampling distribution. So we'll say uh, C 
same plane distribution characteristics. So one thing we're going to need to know um, is the mean of this distribution. And we're going to call the mean mu, so it's like this mu, sub x bar. And this x bar refers to it being a mean of means. So this is actually going to be a distribution of means. So this is a sampling distribution, uh, and it's dis a distribution of means like we talked about in the last video. Sampling distribution of sample means. Right? These are sample means that you get from this population. And what that means is, so we have a sample of nine. So what we're going to do is we're going to, since we know what this population is like, what we're going to do conceptually, you don't actually do this yourself. SPSS will do this for you, do the math. What we're going to do conceptually is take a sample of nine uh, from this, this known population distribution. We're going to calculate that sample's mean. And that sample's mean was a random sample of nine people. We'll get their mean, and we'll put that down here. Then we'll do that. So that was the first time. We'll do that again for another sample of nine. We'll calculate the new sample of nine's mean, and we'll put that down here. We'll do that again for a third sample, a different sample of nine. Calculate their mean, and we'll put that down here. And we're going to do that over and over and over and over again for, until we do every possible sample of nine. And we calculate every sample of nine's mean. And this is a distribution of those means. So these are the kinds of sample means you expect from this distribution if you have sample size of nine. And this includes all possible samples. And so this tells you how likely different kinds of samples are. So it's really unlikely to have sample means that are extreme over here. But it's really common to have sample means that are close to 100. And what we're going to want to figure out ultimately is for a sample mean of 115, our sample mean, how likely, what's the probability, how likely is our sample from the population, from this population up here? How likely is the observed sample to have come from the regular American adult uh, population of IQs? And this process here is considered random sampling because all possible samples are equally, are equally represented. And so samples that are more common are in the middle. Samples that are really unlikely, where you have nine folks over there, right? that's how you get a sample mean over here. Those are less likely. Right? And so most samples are in the middle here. But every now and then, you get these extreme samples. And we want to figure out how likely our sample is from this population. So to do this, we need to figure out where our sample is on here. So one thing we need to know for that is the mean of this distribution. right? So this is the mean of sample means. And this one's really easy. It's equal to the mean of the population. So in this case, they're both equal to 100. The next thing we need to know is the standard deviation of this distribution. And the symbol for that's going to be the standard deviation of the sample means. And there's a, a simple formula for this. You take the population standard deviation, and you divide it by the square root of the sample size. So we already have this information available here. So we'll plug these numbers in. So the population standard deviation was 15. The sample size was 9. We have 15 divided by 3. In this case, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution is going to be 5. Right? So, um, so right over here is 105, because that's one standard deviation over. I want to point out that the standard deviation of the sampling distribution has a special name. It's also known as the standard error, or SE for short. So you could say that the, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution equals the standard error. They're the same thing. And what the idea is here 
for calling it the standard error, um, is this random sampling process um, causes what people refer to as sampling error. Um, and that just means that even if we know what the population mean and standard deviation are, it's possible you get a sample that's not the same as the population just due to random sampling, right? So that's error in the sense that we, we don't know exactly what kind of sample we would expect from the population, right? And so the variation and all the different sample means you get from the population, that variation is an undesirable consequence of random sampling. Right. And the, um, if we consider that variation error, because it's this unde undesirable variation, then the standard error is the standard variation, the standard deviation of this distribution. Right. So the standard error is just the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. And if you have all your sample means here, you could calculate this with the same, the same way we did previously, uh, which is uh, uh, using this formula. Although this would be for each sample mean, and this would be the mean of the means, right? But it's just a regular standard deviation, this, this standard error. Well, if we know the population standard deviation, then we can use this much simpler formula. And almost always throughout this class, this will be the formula that we use. It'll have some slight variation, but the, it'll be the same uh, logic throughout where we take the population standard deviation and divide it by the sample size. Okay. Um, another thing we need to know about this sampling distribution is its shape. What is it, what is it shaped like? If the population distribution is, is normally distributed, which is actually assumed for most of the tests that we're going to talk about, if the population is normally distributed, then the sampling distribution is also normally distributed. But it's also possible that the population distribution isn't perfectly normal. What if it's a, a little bit skewed one way or the other? Or even really skewed? Uh, well, for that, there's actually an important um, idea. So I'll say normal, but I'm going to put it in quotes. Um, because even if the population isn't normal, there's something called the central limit theorem that turns out to be really important. And what the central limit theorem says even is even if your population isn't normal, even if it's not even close to normal, if your sample size is large enough, the sampling distribution is pretty much normal. Right? So the central limit theorem says um, if your population is not normal, it's not normally distributed. The sampling distribution will uh, be pretty much normal with big enough sample sizes. And the more unnormal your population is, the larger the sample size you need to result in a normally distributed sampling distribution. Generally, if your sample size is like 30 or more, um, kind of your, your, your population can be fairly not normal, and you still have a normal, normally shaped distribution uh, for your sampling distribution. And this is important because we don't actually often know what the population's distribution shape is. A lot of things in nature are normally distributed or nearly so. And so this basically means that we don't have to, real, we don't have to worry too much about our population being normal. Uh, because even if it's not normal, if we have a reasonable sample size, this will still be a normal distribution. All right, so what we've done so far um, is we've figured out what 
the, sh the shape and characteristics are of our sampling distribution here. And remember, our goal was to figure out if this observed sample of SUU students, are they probably, is, are SUU students probably as intelligent as regular Americans with an IQ of 100 on average, or SUU students smarter? So now what we can do, since we know what kind of sample means that we expect due to random sampling from this population, is figure out what's the likelihood of getting a sample mean of 115 due to random sampling from this population. All right, so we can calculate the z-score of our sample mean on this distribution. Our sample mean on this distribution, so the z-score is going to be the score minus the mean of the distribution divided by the standard deviation of the distribution. So that's going to be 115 minus, so 115 minus 100 divided by 5. Our z-score is 3. And remember we talked about using z-scores on a normal distribution to figure out what percent is beyond it. And so in this case, if we look at a, a sample mean that's three standard deviations away, there's only dot zero zero one three uh, proportion of this distribution left. So uh, this is a, such an extreme sample. This this 115 is such an extreme sample from this population. You only get a sample this extreme or more extreme, less than one out of hundred about one in a thousand times right so a sample mean of, a, of 115 occurs from this population um, less than like about one in a thousand times so this is a really unlikely sample to have come from a regular American adults and so uh, as researchers at that point we would decide you know our sample of SUU students probably didn't come from this population of regular American adults. It probably came from a different population, and that population is one that's probably of smarter people. Uh, we don't exactly know what that population is like. Our best guess is that that population's mean is 115. It probably isn't, but it's, it's a better guess than 100. Um, and so we would interpret our research that way. Right? And so these three kinds of distributions are going to be a recurring theme throughout this whole class. And we're always going to put our observed sample down here, the population where, um, where we're wondering if our sample's from here, that'll go up on the top, the population distribution will go up here. Right? So we'll have our sample statistics down here, our population parameters up here, and then we're going to have our sampling distribution, and that'll tell us, due to random sampling, what kind of samples we, we would get from this population. And in all cases, we're always going to hope, like happened here, our observed sample is an extreme observation on this distribution, and therefore we'll be able to decide that our, our observed sample probably did not come from this population. And that's going to be the logic all these inferential tests will use all semester.